So now we come to our second major topic that we want to discuss in more detail, and that has to do with um, the kind of impact that we want to have with the knowledge generated in this MOOC. Uh, so we will look at stakeholders and what's in it for them uh, in terms of learning about co-creation. So um, what we can see here, of course, is that uh, the central focus of the MOOC has been on citizen co-creation, but we have emphasized that citizens are very important for co-creation, but not uh, they don't do it on their own or in isolation. They are kind of working together with different stakeholders. So uh, here you can see the groups of stakeholders that uh, we have been visiting uh, when we organized the MOOC. Um, but one that has been rather invisible so far uh, are the most important groups, and that's you as the learners. So we included here uh, now the learners to also uh, ask ourselves, what can you uh, take from this MOOC? What can you learn from it? And how did you profit from the content of the MOOC? So Erik, uh, this MOOC is from AMS. Uh, it's the AMS MOOC. Can you say a little bit more about the expectations that you have of the impact of this MOOC on the learners? Um, well, I would like to, to see the learners also think about themselves, because they are citizens themselves as well, but they are also uh, practitioner, practitioners, uh, perhaps a few future scientists. So um, I want them also to think that um, which party, whichever party they are, um, and, and they strive for sustainability transitions, for instance, that they should take into account what other parties are necessary not even useful, but necessary, in order to achieve this sustainability, because you can't do this in isolation, you need other parties here. So the learners uh, are a very important group, um, and they are part of different other stakeholders groups, uh, and future scientists, that's what you argue. And for this future scientist, for example, uh, well, what, uh, Bas, what would you kind of think they should at least uh, remember from this MOOC, or learn from this MOOC? Well, I think in, uh, in thinking about sustainability transitions, I uh, think socio-technically. And what I mean there is that um, interventions uh, most of the time are thought of being very technical only. So the technical infrastructure, water provision, energy provision. Um, but I think what we've seen in this MOOC, um, the socio-technical context is very important. Whenever you intervene in a, in a, in a, in a slum area, for instance, uh, for, for water provision or energy provision or food provision or whatever, you're intervening in a standing practice. People are dealing already with food and water and en energy. So there's a whole social, uh, social context in which you are intervening with your technology. So be aware, whatever intervention, people are already practicing uh, many yeah. uh, things for, yeah. for, for, for their provisions. So think social technical now. Yeah, uh, I think uh, we all agree with that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it has been the key message that the urban fabric, it's made up of social technical system, but it is a social fabric as well. Yes. That's what you say. Yes. So yeah. any intervention that you do, also as a kind of an engineer, as a technologist, you yeah. have to be aware that you are interfering in a social fabric. Mm. So Sigrid, in, in Vietnam, there has been kind of uh, some examples of uh, co-creation workshops organized by uh, companies in the food sector. Can you uh, explain a little bit what was the relevant kind of social, cultural dimension of that workshops? Yeah, we, indeed we have seen that, especially this was initiated in this case by uh, small and medium local enterprises because there a, was a clear vacuum in between um, what yeah, policy uh, could offer to citizens who are very worried with food safety. It was in the context of uh, urgent food safety uh, risks and concerns among the public. And then you see that small local firms, they are very well aware of this cultural context in which they are trying to take a, yeah, yeah, a space for their activities, their commercial activities, and they completely recognize the importance of involving with citizens to make everything they are engaging in business-wise, but also from a sustainability perspective, relevant within those daily uh, local contexts of the citizens that have to incorporate them in their daily yeah. lives. I remember indeed that uh, in this company uh, stakeholder workshop uh, also the methodology was kind of fine-tuned with some cultural differences in terms of what is the understanding of sustainability, what are the, the, the cultural issues on food uh, and only when you take that into account you can be more effective in your co-creation work. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's definitely super relevant.
Okay, so, so in Vietnam it was uh, in particular the small, local, medium-sized enterprises. Uh, when we then, for example, go to AMS in Amsterdam again, um, uh, Erik, can you tell a little bit about collaboration with companies and co-creation? Uh, yes, because that's the uh, explicit objective of AMS Institute, is basically to uh, create these coalitions and partnerships with not only citizens, but also uh, companies. Uh, like uh, energy suppliers, uh, uh, grid operators, uh, we'll, we'll name it, uh, garbage collecting companies, uh, the water board. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then you see, uh, Walter, for example, that they organize uh, living labs, which is a very kind of famous example of co-creation. Yeah, you... yeah, I think uh, indeed if you look at, uh, at AMS, you see many examples of that and also that there is uh, very much a scientific uh, aspect to that, so that uh, scientists together with other stakeholders are trying to develop new knowledge. Uh, but at the same time, um, uh, you keep seeing uh, this lay expert dimension here as well, yeah. uh, and that it's the question uh, who is giving what input in uh, a co-creation or a stakeholder coll collaboration initiative. So. Um, if it's about knowledge production, uh, then who's producing uh, the knowledge and what knowledge yeah. is it? Yeah, so in Bach society uh, we have discussed so what is the status of knowledge uh, and what's the relation between knowledge and democratization of society, mm -hmm. uh, knowledge and decision making. So these are kind of the big issues uh, that are always, uh, you have to find a solution when you organize a living lab for that. So you have to assign a role to citizens. Uh, but as well to the experts. So, for example, yeah. the water table that uh, we have uh, seen in this uh, MOOC, um, there was a very careful consideration of what do we uh, share with citizens in terms of knowledge and what kind of knowledge is prepared by experts. And yes. So how does it feed in into co-decision making? Can you yes, yes. so that was the example of the adaptation support tool where we really saw that there was a conscious choice when to involve uh, which stakeholders. Uh, when do you uh, invite uh, local experts or when do you invite local residents? Um, but it's here you also see that the level of involvement depends also on the, the interest that uh, the different uh, stakeholders have and the role that they get. So uh, this should be a conscious choice, yeah. who to involve and when to do it. Yeah, yeah. 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 I fully agree with that. And um, so thinking about that makes your uh, commitment with uh, f different forms of co-creation more professional, it, ma it makes it more mature. So just don't start doing things, but uh, think about your methodologies, think about mm -hmm. the sensitivity to local sense of place, so local context, but also who do you invite as stakeholders and what role do you assign to these actors in your co-creation process. Yes, indeed, and just not only mapping them out, but seeing what is their interest and mm -hmm. um, yeah. What is their potential influence on the problem, on the solution? Mm. It's yeah. really important to consider that and from okay. the beginning. I think also if you look at the uh, uh, example of the uh, tablet in the in the water case, uh, also to communicate this clearly to uh, to citizens or to other participating uh, stakeholders, because they have an understanding of how they w would desire to participate in this and what yeah. uh, choices they maybe could make or expect to be yep. able to make yep. um, and if this, this is uh, not communicated clearly and uh, doesn't meet their expectations uh, then it's a question uh, if they feel taken serious by uh, organizing yep. stakeholders. We have seen general the raising support uh, in society for certain kind of problem solutions in terms in the field of sustainability uh, so so Co-creation is important for that, but you should be careful in when and how you organize in order not to lose trust. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, Bas, I've seen throughout the MOOC that NGOs are always uh, very much kind of put up front and uh, their role is uh, kind of said to be very important in all forms of co-creation. Yeah. Do you think NGOs and CBOs are kind of the most privileged um, kind of stakeholder when it comes to organizing uh, co-creations by citizens? Yeah, whether they are privileged, I don't know, but they, they are initiating a lot of uh, projects, uh, including co-creation of uh, citizens, so they are initiating it. So we, we, we've seen the example of Water for People in, uh, in Uganda, and they are setting up a chain of fecal sludge management 
which was not there because it was not provided by the, by the government. And the chain was built up with the informal sector, with small businesses and with citizens to, to create a, a new chain of uh, FIFO yeah. sludge management, yeah. working together and also handing over the chain to the, to the people themselves rather than being for, yeah. involved all the time. So a leading role for NGOs in that yeah, case. to take that yeah. initiative. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think also, if I may add to that, um, uh, if you look at, uh, again, a vast society in uh, Amsterdam, um, that you see that uh, this has a very much an, um, an everyday, uh, everyday life and socio-technical aspect, but also political uh, aspect. So you see that uh, citizens are uh, co-creating on air quality together with this NGO uh, to take their data to the city authorities, but also uh, to find yep. a green road uh, for the daily cycle uh, commute in the city. Okay. Yeah. So um, NGOs can also use a kind of citizens involvement and commitment to co-creation uh, to kind of open up a broader discussion in the city, perhaps on, on city politics, on sustainability politics, like we see in Vietnam, like we see in China, that kind of by uh, engaging with citizens co-creation, uh, they also send signals to the authorities uh, that they want cleaner air, that they want kind of uh, citizen involvement in, in policy making and decision making. I think especially in the context of Asia, this is super vital because um, sometimes it's, it's difficult for policy makers to, to, yeah, to make policies that improve sustainability and um, yeah, um, also support the citizens. Well, NGOs are more on, on, on a, they're more out, outsiders and in that way they can really raise uh, a voice for urgent matters that policy makers are not yet um, yeah, at, at ease with to deal with and um, yeah. that's important. So that means that we have one uh, group of stakeholders uh, still to be discussed and that's a very important one that are the municipal authorities. Uh, they are the key actors in making uh, sustainability politics at city level and uh, they have a kind of function in kind of mediating between different stakeholders uh, and just not have the interest of one group uh, being decisive for the outcome but to make sure that there is enough support among all stakeholders for certain sustainability solutions. So uh, secretly this kind of uh, role of the city authorities and the government uh, in mediating between conflicts. Can you uh, tell a little bit uh, how that, does it relate to urban food? I think it's a very important issue with urban food because uh, urban food is moving, of, yeah, food production is moving into the cities and there it is more and more competing uh, in the public area, in the public space area with other functions within the city mm -hmm. and then of course it becomes important how do you mediate the different interests for the scarce land within the city. Yeah. Yeah. City yeah. boundaries, yeah. I remember that we discussed in one of the contributions that it's not just a matter of building consensus, but sometimes also handling conflicts. So there are kind of uh, citizens that are affected in a negative way by certain forms of uh, uh, policy making for sustainability. And they kind of raise their voices and they start competing and organizing a kind of protest demonstration. I think that's also part of co-creation. Yeah, yes. I, if I may add to that, I think you see that also with the example of bike parades uh, very clearly, uh, that citizens try to break open uh, the city for slow mobility. At the same time, of course, uh, as you say, city authorities have to uh, take in, into account uh, a whole broader set of yeah. uh, issues, uh, sustainability issues, uh, but also interests of different groups of uh, citizens. Yeah. I can see. So they are the managers of the public sphere, of public space, and, and that they have a very particular also political responsibility. For example, in water, you can yes. see water is a kind of a thing that you should not, um, as a city authority, be too... Uh, no, it's a responsible task yes. to think about the water management in the city, and we've seen there too that uh, there are multiple interests, and there are, so there are a lot of stakeholders who want to have a claim on the water. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So as an uh, authority, you really have to yeah, balance out all those interests and overall still safeguard that your city is safe and uh, protected yep. against uh, flooding, for example. Yes. I think that's very important uh, that you say, well, there are some kind of preconditions to be met. So first we want to have dry feet mm -hmm. and a, yeah. a kind of a safe uh, system uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to flooding. 
And then within that, you can of course uh, make room for co-decision making and uh, kind of co-creating sustainable cities. Um, so that's why we in uh, this MOOC, um, when talking about co-creation, have emphasized a lot uh, the role of uh, citizen co-creating sustainability politics at city level. So, and we have distinguished that from kind of forms of co-creation that happen in everyday life. I think both kind of uh, basic forms of co-creation have shown to be very relevant uh, uh, for the MOOC. So with these two closing panels, we finalized the MOOC on co-creating sustainable cities. We hope that uh, by this MOOC you have been introduced in the many and rich forms of co-creation that exist all around the world. Citizens turn out to be very important in co-creation in order to make the city more sustainable. In the next future, uh, we will continue to work on this topic of co-creation. We will just explore the many different forms that exist and thereby also emphasize that both technological and social dynamics are very important in making cities more sustainable. So we hope that you will provide us feedback on the MOOC and give us some inputs to the future agenda of AMS, Technical University of Delft and Wageningen University to kind of uh, elaborate our research agenda. Thank you for joining us in the MOOC.